Hello there. It's Thursday at noon. I know it is. Do you remember our arrangement? Thursdays at noon on CFUV. Are you ready to get started? What do you have in mind? What I want to do now is called first person plural. You make it sound excessively attractive. That's what I have in mind. to talk about social issues, and social is plural. It involves two or more people. Second, we wanted to do a show together as a team. In our married life, we have come to recognize that we complement each other in many ways. We enjoy each other's company. We don't always see the world the same way, but we respect each other's points of view. We are first person plural. So it seems fitting that we celebrate our togetherness on the air, as this episode is being initially broadcast on our 10th wedding anniversary, October 10th, 2002. Because we are who we are, we will begin our celebration with sociologist Connie Sheehan. Dr. Sheehan is a family sociologist at the University of Florida who edits the Journal of Family Issues and who has co-authored a textbook, Marriages and Families, Reflections of a Gendered Society, which will have a new edition coming out later this year. She talks about why a sociological perspective is important if we are to understand the nature of marriages and families and how families interact with the larger society. Then we will talk with Gordon and Joyce Cunningham. This Victoria couple has been married for 59 years. Yes, you heard right. Next year they will be celebrating 60 years together and they are still going strong. They talk about their life together and share some words of wisdom with a young couple who have only 10 years under their belts. Finally, we present an audio album of our wedding. We wish we could show you the pictures but we think sharing some of our memories, including poetry and song, will be more entertaining than seeing pictures of people you don't know. So we hope you will stay with us throughout the hour as we present our wedding anniversary episode entitled, I Do. start out with a really basic question about why you do what you do. I think when most people think about families and think about marriage, they think of it as being in the professional domain of either psychology or medicine. So why do you think it's important to have a sociologist study this? Well, I think it makes a lot of sense for psychologists and physicians to study family issues, but they tend to focus on these as individual-centered problems. And in sociology, we recognize that families are small groups of persons with dynamics uh, that are affected by any one person's problems. So if a child has a, a long-term illness, that affects the dynamics that go on between the parents, affects the other children in the family. So the small group aspect the fact that a family is more than just one individual is one of the reasons that sociology is valuable for studying families. But the other aspect, which is something we hear about in the, in the news more often, is that families are embedded in the societal context. So mm -hmm. when things happen in the economy, for instance, that affects what goes on in families. 
uh, not only in terms of the very visible effects of spending money, but it, it can affect stress levels, it can affect conflict. So sociologists tend to take this broader perspective, looking at families as small groups and families as one institution in a larger society. In a larger picture. Right. When you were talking about how society affects families, do you ever study like the ways in which families affect society? Yes, Is- many sociologists do study how families affect society in general. And that's somewhat of a controversial issue because some policymakers, some journalists, some citizens in general think that the problems of society are caused by family changes. For instance, changing morals in families, changing ideas about sexuality might have an impact on the culture. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it depends partly on what kind of philosophical perspective you take. But one of the things I study is employment in families. So it's, it's fairly straightforward to think about how families can affect the labor market by preparing young people who become diligent workers who show up at work on time, uh, so, yes, you can look at it from both directions. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that politically a lot of, you mentioned policymakers, and I think that a lot of political policymakers spend a lot of time talking about how dysfunction in the family leads to problems in society. And I think that sociologists, though, take a more, I want to say holistic, that might not be the right word, but a more, a broader perspective on that, that it's that it's more than a one-way street. Absolutely. We often think of societies as systems, just like you would look at a car engine, or if you look at the human body, it's a, it's a complex system. The, the cause and effect relationships don't go in one direction only, as you said, so it's really hard to isolate cause and effect. Anytime something happens in one part of the engine or one part of the human body, it does affect the rest of the body or the rest of the engine. And, and so that is why it's hard to, to say cause changes in family cause changes in society or vice versa. Mm-hmm. Another interesting thing that you mentioned that I, I just want to touch on is you said that some sociologists kind of look at it in a small group way mm-hmm. where they are actually looking at the interactions of a family in the same way that sociologists study other kinds of groups. So there's a kind of micro level and macro level yeah. to study of families. Are there any like trends in that area? Is Is it... Are there plenty of sociologists doing both kinds of work? And I know that you are editor of the um, Journal of Family Issues. Journal of Family Issues. And so I know that you are able to keep track of, in that position, a lot of the latest studies that are going on. Yes. For many years, sociologists who study families have looked at the impact of changes in gender roles on family dynamics. And so... Recently, we've been seeing quite a few papers that look at how the division of household labor has been affected by women's employment. So in other words, uh, with more and more women going to the labor market to work, how is that affecting who does the housework and who takes care of the children? That's a big issue that's receiving a lot of attention. And I would guess that would also include how male roles are changing because of that. Absolutely. How men's roles and women's roles are changing in our society. That's a major topic in sociology and in a number of other fields. Another change that we've seen recently in sociology of families is a greater look at children. This may sound strange that I'm saying that this is a recent development because children are an integral part of families. But believe it or not, sociologists for many, many decades actually studied children and families only in terms of the ways that they were affected by their parents, the ways that parents socialized children Mm -hmm. to behave in certain ways. And now sociologists are recognizing that children also are active agents in family lives, that children affect their parents just as much as, or influence their parents just as much, perhaps even more so than parents affect kids, and that children's actives on family issues are really important. Uh, One of the interesting papers that I've reviewed recently looked at children's reports of domestic violence or of marital conflict. Mm -hmm. Sometimes parents think that 
if they're arguing softly behind closed bedroom doors, their children aren't aware of the conflict, that they can hide the marital difficulties from their children. Mm-hmm. But children are, are pretty adept at picking up on subtle cues, and, and they're actually pretty good reporters about what this, the relationship is like between their parents. So this includes... When you first said reports, I thought that it might also include like the kinds of reports that they actually give when there's intervention. Is this just oh. their, is by reports you mean just the way that they talk about it, or do you mean in a legal sense? It can, I actually meant in terms of research, responses to researchers' questions, but actually children are often asked by courts to report on family dynamics in terms of child abuse or domestic violence of some other type. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I really meant it in the research sense, but but it also applies in the broader context in terms of reporting to, to social service agencies. So I think it's fair to say, and I'd, I'd like you to maybe expand on this a little bit, I think some people might see these issues as more academic than mm-hmm. they really are. What we're really talking about here is the ways in which families affect everyday living. Absolutely. And so this research goes beyond, it has application to actually making family life better and making the everyday life better. Absolutely. One of the things that, that I like to look at is how parents' jobs affect their children's everyday lives. I've studied ministers and their families, male and female ministers. One of the characteristics of that profession is that there's often required relocation. In other words, every year or so, ministers are reviewed and they may be asked to move to another congregation. And so I've been interested in looking at how those moves from one community to another that are required by the parent's job affect kids' adjustment to new schools, Mm -hmm. uh, their health and well-being. And so that certainly, research like that, certainly has an impact on children's everyday lives or gives us insight into their everyday lives. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that a lot of family sociologists uh, interact with policymakers? Are policymakers in the United States paying attention? I definitely believe so. Perhaps we haven't reached the full potential, but I know that the organization that I participate in The National Council on Family Relations is interdisciplinary. It has sociologists, psychologists, home economists, nurses, teachers, and a number of other professionals. There's actually a policy arm or policy branch of this organization, and there's a representative located in Washington, D.C., and the representative from the organization is ready to provide information to the lawmakers whenever they need it or ask for it. Mm Mm-hmm. So that is one of the goals of researchers is to try to get the message out to people who can make a difference in people's everyday lives. And the organization that you mentioned, it it in turn has had an impact on how these different disciplines are educating their students at the university level, hasn't it? Absolutely. There's a major, another major emphasis in the organization is on education and enrichment, and that means educating community members about things like domestic violence, but it also includes improving teaching about families, keeping people updated about what the most effective teaching and learning techniques are, uh, educating teachers about films and videos that are available or new computer technology that's available to teach about families. So the organization is concerned with education, and the enrichment part of it is um, evaluating some of the new state programs that have been designed to make marriages more successful. In, hmm. in, in Florida, for instance, in 1998, I believe, a state law was passed that required public schools to have education about marriage and family life and also provided an option for couples who are getting married to take a four-hour course in marriage preparation that would then reduce the amount of money they had to pay for their marriage license. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. So many states are, are changing their laws about marriage and family to try to reduce the divorce rate, try to make marriages more successful. The, one of the things that I think I know about is there's a certification that is oh, available. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, it, and it pushes um, a cross discipline yes. understanding of families. Yeah, yeah. The National Council on Family Relations has a 
program called the Certified Family Life Educator Program. Mm -hmm. It's for professionals from a full range of disciplines who work with families in different capacities. And the program is designed to make sure that the professionals in these areas have competency on, I think it's 10 different domains of family life. One of them is the internal dynamics of families, what causes conflict, how can you resolve conflict. Uh, Another is diversity in families, how families are changing and how families with different economic backgrounds have may have different needs or resources. So that is one of the uh, major education efforts that the organization has developed over the years, it's the, the certification program to be a family life educator. And is the trend toward more and more universities in the United States uh, offering that as part of their programs? Yes. Um, every year the National Council on Family Relations reports on the new programs that have added the certified training in family life education, and the number is increasing every year. It's in the United States and Canada. I don't know if it's hit Europe yet, but definitely in the United States and Canada, more and more programs. I can't give you an accurate count of them, but I suspect there are well over 100 university oh, wow. programs. I didn't realize it had gotten up to that many. That's I great. I think it has. I, I could be off by a little bit, but uh, some of them have the program on a bachelor's level. Some have the programs designed for the master's level, and some have them for Ph.D. level. And then, of course, some of them combine all the levels. Mm-hmm. But it is becoming much more popular. And individual professors can also be certified. So it works on both levels. The individual instructor can be certified and the entire program can be certified. Oh, okay. And at the so, University of Florida, our uh, program in family, youth, and community sciences, I believe, has recently been certified to offer this program. Oh, that's good news. Mm-hmm. Very good news. And with this kind of interdisciplinary approach, then it sounds like they are indeed addressing some real specific social issues and how it impacts on families yeah one of the one of the big issues these days is how the recent welfare reform at the federal level has affected families that's a big issue which we affectionately call welfare demise (laughs) yes right that's one of the big issues people are also looking at how environmental issues, environmental toxins that Hmm. families and children are exposed to, how that can affect their health and well-being. So, yeah, it sounds... Very interesting. Yeah. Many of these topics sound as though they're esoteric and intellectual and empty exercises, but in fact, I think most of them do have direct implications for people's everyday lives. Yes. Well, listen, I really appreciate you talking with us and uh, gave us a lot of good information to think about on our anniversary. (laughs) Oh, happy anniversary. Yes. Oh, my goodness, 10 years. 10 years, yes. So, anyway, Connie, I very much appreciate it. Well, thank you, and I hope I actually gave you some sound bites you can actually use. Oh, you gave us plenty. We're going to be able to use most of it, no problem. Well, I hope so. It sounds like it'll be fun. So thank you for thinking of me. (laughs) And when you come back to Florida for a visit, look me up. Sure will. All right. You take care. Okay, you too, Patty. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM, Victoria. been married 59 years yes. last April. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. So you guys don't look old enough. <laughs> and that's our, I used to say that. Yeah. Well, we were you look like young. you were 12 or something when you well, got Joyce married. Joyce was actually 9. But <laughs> oh. Not really. And she's been getting younger <laughs> all the time, huh? Well, we, we thought we were old enough, so I guess we were old well. Are you thinking about making it permanent? <laughs> yes, we are. I think so. Yeah, I think so. I wish everybody could do the same thing. Yes. So tell us a little bit about how you met and why you decided to marry each well, other. Well, it was very easy. Joyce lived next door. Uh-huh. <laughs> so you literally married the girl next door. That's you really good. Did. I you carried her books to school. <laughs> <laughs> so, there you are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> but uh, he had lived there, and we moved next door, and, and I had man him up. But we, this was in Saskatoon. We were up at Waska Sioux, which is where everybody goes for this Prince Albert holidays. National Park. And, uh, Gordon used to deliver papers there. This was a long time ago. And 
I knew him from that, so we moved in, and all of a sudden I saw him, and I said, guess who we've moved next door, that red-headed guy from the lake. <laughs> and then I got my eye on him. Uh -huh. So it was you that roped him in? Is that oh, what you're no. telling us? <laughs> when I saw Joyce up at the lake, I can remember there was a, there was a, um, it's in the movies in those days, there was a, uh, a singer, wee Bonnie Baker, and she wore bib overhauls doing one song, and I spotted Joyce with bib overhauls on, and I thought, that's the cutest girl I've ever seen. <laughs> <laughs> so how old were you when... Well, when I was, uh, uh, we, were, we were 19, and I was 19 when I got married, but uh, that was about, uh, well, I guess about 15, yeah. 15. So. so did you start courting each other immediately, or...? Well, I went on to we about 17, and then I got pretty serious, didn't I? <laughs> yes. <laughs> this was during the war that you met? Uh, it was prior to the war. Uh, uh, we got married in 42, 43. So were you in the military when you got married? No, I, out? no I was, uh, I had uh, volunteered and been turned down for a heart murmur. And then when I got my, that was for the Air Force, when I got the call up for the, uh, the Army, uh, they confirmed that uh, I had a heart murmur, so okay. I was, I was uh, blue slipped. Okay. And I don't remember, but he survived until he was, how old were you when you had your heart operation? <laughs> oh, that's 20 years ago, so. Well, but we did have some separations during, uh, during the war. Gordon was on the railway mail, so that, uh, the, the we, I traveled on the train sorting mail, uh, and uh, I was on the spare board, and I'd get sent to uh, small divisional centers where you had to and big, like Edmonton, I'd be sent up there for three weeks and not get home. I'd be sent to Nippewin in Saskatchewan for three weeks and not get home. You know, so we had separations. Yeah. And then later on, uh, I was postmaster of the Eastern Arctic, and I'd be gone for six months at a time, but we lived through all that. You were postmaster where? The Eastern Arctic. Goodness gracious. <laughs> six months sea voyage, carrying the Canadian flag into these uncharted waters. So. Okay. This was before Amundsen discovered the Northwest Passage. Just about. Hudson was still floating around in a boat. <laughs> Not quite. Not quite. Yes, well, this was 1952 and 53. Significantly after Hudson, I believe. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, what other kind of struggles have you weathered over the years? You talk about separations were there. Well, I guess the, 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 we survived that very well. I was home having babies at that time, and, and uh, I don't know. So the six long. months he was home, you utilized well, I take it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, but uh, struggles. I, I no, actually, our life has been, uh, it's Camelot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, we, we've, uh, we've both progressed from the time we, uh, we got married. Joyce was a... Uh, uh, studied voice and uh, and piano, and later in life she got her uh, accreditation from the Toronto Conservatory as a piano teacher. And I just I joined the post office during the war because uh, that was one of the places that the selective service would allow me to work. And I just worked my way up, and I never there wasn't a day that I didn't enjoy going to work. And I ended up being the I started out as a part-time letter carrier and ended up as the regional general manager for post offices, all the post offices on, on, in Ontario. So, you know, life has been very good to us. Mm -hmm. Now, at the beginning, we certainly didn't have much money, and it's, you know, we had reasonable salary, I suppose, but, you know, we certainly weren't, weren't wealthy. And always had rented accommodation for a long time, that kind of thing. Was there any period during the last 59 years that you regretted or thought about leaving each other, or any of that kind of you stuff? You know, that's the thing. It, it, we've never had that. We have been very, very fortunate. But uh, uh, I think we grew together, and uh, I, I don't know, we didn't have the struggles. No, we no. didn't. You know, and I guess one of the things that I've noted that people, in their sense of humor, they, when they're in company, they will take shots at one another. And I think that's so destructive. <laughs> it's, it's not the thing. To, we've always believed in each other. Mm -hmm. And we enjoyed being together because we support each other. You know, if you know, we show appreciation for your endeavors and... and, and I, I think now we're, we're surprisingly 
we're closer than ever, you know, and, and if I come home and he's not home, the house just feels empty, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, maybe it is unique, but it, it has been very special for us. How many children did you have? We have three boys. Three boys and mm -hmm. grandchildren, great-grandchildren? We have 11 grandchildren and uh, three great-grands now. We just had a family reunion this summer. One of our granddaughters got married down in Ontario, and it was Gordon's uh, 80th birthday, so we had a real family get-together there. Everybody was there. It was wonderful. It was yeah. quite a family. Yeah, it's a wonderful family, yeah. yeah. We've got to, his boys are all married. Mm -hmm. yeah. One of them has six children. Oh, goodness. <laughs> yes, that accounts for the 11. <laughs> yeah, for the 11, yeah. And, I mean, we've seen them, you know, through their problems. Everybody has some problems. But, uh, they're, they're, I think, uh, pretty, pretty substantial now. So you mentioned that you grew together and that you've been supportive of each other. What other kinds of, I guess, secrets of long a lasting relationship would you offer? I think growing together is part of it. I mean, there, you know, there were, we had busy lives, and um, I know our Friday nights out was a big one. We'd always go out and, and have dinner and probably a glass of wine or two <laughs> and uh, uh, just chat around. And I think later on, uh, Gordon retired early, and uh, one night when we were out, he said, you know, he said, I think I'm going to, I'm going to leave. And I, that really surprised me because I hadn't, I, I know he was under, it was a very stressful job. And, uh, but he figured it all out and, and uh, he was working for what the, the boy in the mail room made, you know, when you think the difference of if he went to took his pension. So I, that's okay. So he did. <laughs> uh, stress. Oh. Well, sometimes you get a little huffy with one another. I mean, it, you know, we just, uh, I don't what, know. What have you done lately? <laughs> <laughs> Not lately. <laughs> My so how do you resolve, when you have conflicts, how do you resolve them? I think talking. This is really is what we do. And, and we have such a solid base. We you have some, so much history of it. Uh, uh, no, we do discuss things. We don't do things. We don't go off and do things on our own, like without telling the other one. The only ever thing he ever did, he went out and bought a, bought a car, <laughs> and without me, he went with his friend, and he never did that again. <laughs> oh, I, I learned a lesson. What did you do to the car? <laughs> Road in it, of course. Oh. It was a dumb car. <laughs> I thought you might have pushed it off a cliff or something. Just... No, I just wanted to push it like that. <laughs> like that commercial where the Kia commercial, have you seen it, where she takes his golf clubs and goes oh, up yes. to the highest club and I throws them over. Oh. <laughs> Yeah. Because you might have uh, gone to the fabled cliffs of Saskatchewan. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, Cypress Hills. Cypress Hills, for sure. So, uh, no. no, I can't think that we've had any, any real, I mean, we, we used to work things out. If we're if not quite agreeable, I can usually talk them into what I want. <laughs> yeah. But do you think that it is give and take? I mean, you talk him, but he's talked you into things too, or? Certainly, it, it's, it's sharing. That's what it's all about, mm -hmm. you know. In everything you do, it's sharing. Mm -hmm. You know, Maslow uh, comes up with a hierarchy of motivational steps, and they hold for marriage also. You know, you get to the point where you like to uh, have recognition, and uh, you know, this sort of, and you have to have your own accomplishments. It works out. Yeah, and we do kiss a lot, and we tell each other we love each other, and we like each other, and I think that has to be done. It's not a bad thing. Do you thing. still hold hands in public? Oh, yes. yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> we, I mean, we've been married 10 years now, and I have friends who comment on that. I can't believe you still hold hands in public. I'm like, we've only been married 10 years. <laughs> well, the physical contact's pretty nice, you know. Yeah. yeah. You said you're a piano teacher. Yeah. How about composition? Have you ever written him a love song? No, I'm sorry. I'm not. I'm not productive in that way. I might sing him one, but uh, not. Not never written one. I just a thought. I might try. And you were with the. Uh, you were with Canada Post. Did you ever write her a love letter? Oh. oh. <laughs> well, you should see. Them. No, you shouldn't. Well, anyway, <laughs> the 
letters he wrote Wait, me. why is it we shouldn't see? What is it? Oh, well, she's not going to share. Stuff in it, oh. that's all. And, and uh, they were treasures, that, you know, and he still got them. A lot of it was the story of what he was seeing, which was so unique. And uh, Oh, that's wonderful. Uh, so we've got those. I think we might edit them a little bit for even to the kids, but... Uh, <laughs> I think pretty good. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's... Well, Gordon's a good writer, and he? he's written me poems, that sort of thing, oh, not that's musicals. Nice. <laughs> that is nice. I guess the only other question I have is, um, you, you talk about you retired early and so mm -hmm. forth. Do you think, I mean, what have you done since the retirement? Was that well, an adjustment to go from him being gone a lot to <laughs> him being around a lot? A couple of things. But he, you, the first morning, you, you just... No, I always thought I was a workaholic because I'd go years without holidays. I couldn't get, break myself away from it. In the morning I, that I'd retired on the July the 12th, and on the 13th I slept in. I found out that I was a bum. I really didn't. <laughs> but but uh, then we had a stint with the uh, United Nations, and we went down and lived in Suriname for two years. And since then, uh, we've uh, uh, taken a university ship around the world, did a semester at sea. We circumnavigated South America. Uh, we've been uh, through the Aegean and the Adriatic. Uh, <laughs> uh, we toured the capitals of Europe. The, the, you know, well, we've done some beach holidays too. We've had good holidays. We've been yeah. to the Cook Islands, Fiji. And Australia. And uh, Goodness. Singapore and Malaysia and uh, that area. So yes, you know, we've done a lot, we've seen a lot, we've made, we've made the mess of our time. And of course we've had comparatively good health. And that's the three things that you need in retirement. We have it. We have comparatively good health, we have the money that uh, are to do the things that our health will allow us, and we have each other share that with. And so... One well, thing I have to tell you, when he uh, retired, took over the kitchen. Oh, wow. He's a wonderful cook. That's where the food is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nah. He cooks more than I do. Oh, now, all so. right, all right. But, uh, but I, I found it very difficult for the first few months because I thought, you know, I've always done it. I, I'm a good short order cook. I'm not a, a chef, I, I, but I've got many meals for our kids in a big hurry and that kind of thing. And we ate pretty Okay. But you always did some cooking on the on weekends. The weekend. But that's not unusual. I've, I've read uh, sociological studies of men who retire, and they do become much more domesticated mm -hmm. upon retirement. Mm -hmm. They clean, they cook, they do all those things that we would hope they had done. Like <laughs> <laughs> well, not they, now, of course, it's fine. Pleasant company excluded. He's oh, about he, ready to get me now. No, and, no. Uh, but a considerable amount of men in the world, my dear, do not do these things during their work lives, mm -hmm. even when their wives work. You're an exceptional guy. <laughs> well, well, Gordon always was helpful around the house, but I mean, and he did cook, certainly, and on the weekends and that kind of thing, he'd like to do that. But So once I got adjusted to it, it was fine. <laughs> but sometimes I go in the kitchen and I don't know what we need and what we have. But uh, we do share, too. I do, I do help him sometimes. Okay. <laughs> Um, and then you're active, I know, over here at the Senior Center. Yeah, that takes a good, that's a good interest for, for both of us. Gordon's active there, too, but this is a, a good thing. I enjoy doing that very much. Well, we volunteered there for quite a while. I like to work in the kitchen. Like Joyce is <laughs> I work in the kitchen over there. there. <laughs> Joyce is president over there. Yeah. This is her third year. So. Yeah. So, uh, and and it's, it's very satisfying. It's a nice place to work and with good people. So how long have you been in Victoria? When we came back from Suriname, uh, we started out here in the wintertime for three months. And that was Joyce's mother and dad were living here then. And uh, we, we had uh, sold our home in Toronto and moved up to uh, Georgian Bay. We had a home up there. And uh, we would stay there until our New Year's, then come out here for three months, and then go back. And, and that's where all grandkids grew up in mm -hmm. all the summers. Yeah. And then, uh, oh, I guess it was about our 65th birthday, Joyce said, you know, they're starting to give us these checks. <laughs> what, what are we going to do? So we bought a small place and was going to be a pit of terre, you know. Just over on, uh, on, on Oscar. Oscar here. And uh, 
Then we started to stay a few months longer, and it got to be six months. And then about, uh, we were staying practically the year. Mm -hmm. And uh, two years ago, we sold the place in uh, Ontario, and we're here full time. So off and on, we've been out here for 20 years. <laughs> <laughs> A very slow move. <laughs> it was. <laughs> well, we drove back and forth, or, you know, every every year, and it, uh, and that was used to be an adventure, and then it got to be just, uh, well, we got tired of doing it. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, they were good years. We had the lake, and, and we had the family always mm -hmm. came up, and all the kids spent lots of time with us. So. That one of our grandsons thought thinks he's going to take after his grandfather because he he's only known him when he's retired and he figures that's right. <laughs> he said, what are you going to do when you, he said, I'm going to be like Poppy. That's me. <laughs> Skip the little part. Eh? <laughs> well, he's at school, thank goodness. <laughs> yeah. Most of them are growing up now. You know, they're working. University you know, they're degrees. And quite a few in the university still. Last word of advice like to a couple who have been married 10 years or? <laughs> I guess talk to one another, uh, be forgiving, uh, be interested, and don't be afraid to show your love. I mean, My God, I'm doomed. <laughs> <laughs> and have a sense of humor, I hope. Oh, yes. Sense of humor helps yeah, tremendously. It does. Yeah. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you for your time. You're yeah, more than welcome. welcome. You're listening to First Person Plural on CFUV, Victoria's Public Radio, 101.9 FM, 104.3 Cable, and on the internet, cfuv.uvig.ca. Giving sociology an edge!
first person plural. Today is a special episode celebrating our 10th wedding anniversary. This is our 10th wedding anniversary. Since we cannot share pictures of our wedding over the radio, we decided to share our memories of the day. We gathered with our friends at a park in St. Petersburg, Florida on a beautiful October Saturday and had a potluck picnic. We played games and ate great food and were creatively lazy all afternoon. As sunset drew near, we asked our friends to gather around on the ground, and we sat down with our closest friends, Howard and Peggy, nearby so they could witness our vows and stand up for us as a couple. Our niece, Crystal, also participated. Our friend Bob, an ordained minister who presided over the ceremony, began our wedding with these words. In ancient lore, there existed a bird that was reborn from its own ashes. Instead of dying, the legend says, it made a nest of strong exotic spices and herbs on the top of a palm tree, set it on fire, and died. From the burned body of the first bird, a young phoenix issued forth. The symbol of the phoenix is one of becoming whole and new from the ashes of one's own life. Most beings spring from other individuals, but there is a certain kind that comes from within, not from another. Ten years ago today, we gathered with our friends and family to celebrate life and rebirth. We both had had experience with ashes. We both had seen our lives turn to ashes and from that bottom chose a new life that was more full of hope than the previous one. Just as the new phoenix must start again as a youth, so did we have to begin again as babes. Ten years ago today, we began a new part of our lives. We have learned since then that being together meant renewing our lives over and over again. We have had additional experience with ashes in the past ten years, only this time we have risen together, and it seems that each bottom gets a little higher as we learn to play and enjoy life together. Our friend Peggy read Love Song by Rainier Maria Rilke. How shall I hold my soul that it may not be touching yours? How shall I lift it then above you to where other things are waiting? Ah, gladly would I lodge it all forgot with some lost thing the dark is isolating, 
on some remote and silent spot that when your depths vibrate is not itself vibrating? You and me, all that lights upon us though, brings us together like a fiddle bow. Drawing one voice from two strings, it glides along. Across what instrument have we been spanned? And what violinist holds us in his hand? O oh, sweetest song. Our niece, Crystal, read these words from Paul's second letter to the Corinthians. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always perseveres. Love never fails. And now these three remain. Faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Ten years ago today, we said these words to each other. You and I met as strangers, each carrying a mystery within us. I may never know who you are. I may never know you completely. But I trust that you are a person in your own right, possessed of a beauty and value that are Earth's richest treasures. So, I renew this promise to you. I will impose no identities upon you. I will invite you to become yourself without shame or fear. I will hold a space for you in the world and defend your right to fill it with an authentic vocation. For as long as your search takes, you have my loyalty. So I take you to be my partner in life, to have and to hold from this day forward, for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health, to love and cherish one day at a time. I give you my trust and all my tomorrows. Ten years ago today, I sang you this song. What a dream I had Resting in organdy the shop displays I heard cut the walls tripping down the alleyways as I walked on and as you ran to me your cheeks flushed with the night we walked on frosted Our 
heard read excerpts from Khalil Gibran's The Life of Love as found in tears and laughter. Spring. Come, my beloved, let us walk amidst the knolls, for the snow is water, and life is alive from its slumber and is roaming the hills and valleys. Let us follow the footprints of spring into the distant fields and mount the hilltops to draw inspiration high above the cool green plains. Come, my beloved, let us drink the last of winter's tear from the cupped lilies and soothe our spirits with the shower of notes from the birds and wonder in exhilaration through the intoxicating breeze. Let us sit by that rock where violets hide. Let us pursue their exchange of the sweetness of kisses. Summer. Let us go into the fields, my beloved, where the time of harvest approaches and the sun's eyes are ripening the grain. Let us tend the fruit of the earth. As the spirit nourishes the grains of joy from the seeds of love, so deep in our hearts. Autumn. Let us retreat, for the tired brook has ceased its song and the bubblesome springs are drained of their copious weeping and the cautious old hills have stored away their colorful garments. Come, my beloved, nature is justly weary and is bidding her enthusiasm farewell with quiet and contented melody. Winter, come close to me, O companion of my full life. Come close to me, and let not winter's touch enter between us. Sit by me before the hearth, for fire is the only fruit of winter. Feed the lamp with oil, and let it not dim, and place it by you, so I can read with tears when your life with me has written upon your face. Bring autumn's wine. Let us drink and sing the song of remembrance to spring's carefree sowing, and summer's watchful tending, and autumn's reward in harvest. been listening to First Person Plural on CFUV 101.9 FM in Victoria, British Columbia. 
simulcasted on 104.3 cable and cfuv.uvic.ca. First Person Plural is produced weekly by Dr. Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson. Music for First Person Plural is composed, performed, and produced by Carl Wilkerson. For more information about First Person Plural or Patty Thomas and Carl Wilkerson, visit our website, culturalconstructioncompany.com.